Let's go ahead and bring in Steiner Sports CEO, Brandon this Steiner. One of the country's top this memorabilia one. mogul. I have an unbelievable guest, Brandon this Steiner. One. Brandon's second to none. One of my favorite people and one of my favorite announcers, Mike Breen, joining us. Hello, Mike. You say that to every announcer that comes in here. I say it to a few. <laughs> yeah, I do say it to a few. But you are truly one of my favorites just because, and we were just talking about this, you're doing the NBA Finals. You're two inches away from LeBron, Jordan. But I remember playing basketball with you 30 years ago. Yep. And you were, you were a writer for, I think, The Post. Or was the Daily News? No, no, no writer. You were, you were. I, you, was, I was a broadcast at NBC Radio at the time. I was kind a, of a. I was a producer. A producer. Then. You were kind of a mod, had a moderate. It wasn't like you were headed automatically to stardom. What? Where was the break there? Because I remember all of a sudden when you got the first crack, where you were going to start doing. I think the first thing was the Nick games. Well, the f the first thing that actually yeah um, really got my name out there was <clears throat> I filled in on the IMA show. Oh, Don the morning, Cricky, right, yeah, right. Don Cricky uh, was Imus' sportscaster, and he would miss every Friday and Monday during the football season. So I asked uh, the program director, hey, could I fill in for Cricky? And he said yes. So I got on the Imus show. Was it just that simple, an ask? Just that simple. Nobody had thought to, to have asked before. Of course, we had to go back and get permission for Imus. And at, at the time, he was still in his drinking days, and he agreed to let me come on. And then threw me out of his office and the next morning when I went in he had no recollection of who I was and he wound up interviewing me live on the air on my first sports cast it was a scary a and situation he took a, I've ever but, been but he took a liking to you uh, he played he was, on you, you he know. was so good to me and taught me so many things in the business um, I, I can't even begin to repay all the different things that I learned and, and happened to me because of him. But you, did you ever think of yourself as being funny? Because you, you, you had to kind of play into the humor of that show. No, it was hard. And in fact, my, my, um, I have brother, I, I grew up a family of six boys. And my brothers used to have people come up to him and say, hey, your, your brother's really funny on Imus. And they'd be like, what? This can't, this is not my brother. They had no idea. They were all funnier than I was. Uh, but it was, what it did, Brandon has got me out of my comfort zone. Instead of just doing straight sports, I had to adjust and do satire and do humor and try and come up with different things. And it, I felt it really, it really expanded uh, what I was able to do. Expanded your game. About. Yeah, that, it really did, right? Absolutely. Now the Nick, that was the Nick thing. The next, right off that, um, Mike McCarthy, who was one of the executives at the Great OSG guy. Network, uh, the best, and he um, he gave me the shot. He gave me a chance and. He went to the people at the garden and said, hey, this young guy I think could, could do the Knicks radio. Was you and Clyde? Correct. And uh, because of Mike's confidence in me, he got me the job. And, and that was, that was for, from the NBA standpoint, that was the biggest break. You were a great uh, – and that was also Clyde coming into his own also. You were a perfect I, – I thought a perfect match for Clyde too. You gave him his room. You set him up well. At the same time, um, you covered all the basics. You were a great fundamental – broadcaster I thought you know so you had both kind of covered you never know when you work with a guy for the first time sometimes chemistry never gets there sometimes it takes a couple of years for some reason we just we clicked right away and part of it I mean I have so much respect for him as a player there's still in, in my mother's house in Yonkers where I grew up there's still a poster of Clyde that's hanging up on the wall the greatest Nick ever right and for me to to say I was his partner it was surreal I just couldn't believe it. And he was so gracious to me and so welcoming that it made it easy. What's the hard part about your job? I and mean, you know, you, obviously you're doing the big games. You're on the stage. I mean, you know, there's, there's no better opportunity. It's worldwide. And, but what's the hardest part about your job? Travel and being away from your family. I'm a dad and a husband. And, um, you know, you, you miss birthdays. You miss um, dance recitals. You miss baseball games. And you have to have a family that understands, and uh, it's hard. There's some nights you're in hotel rooms, and you know that you know one of your kids is having a birthday party, and but it's a sacrifice you make. And then when you're not working, you make sure you're just with them all the time, and um, that's part of having a, a wonderful family. So that's without question the hardest part. Because there are some dates that are just locked down. There's nothing you can do. You got to be there. Right. right? Exactly. It's I mean, not. 
although uh, the birth of the kids, I was able to get there for all of them. My daughter was very, very considerate. She was born between games two and three of a playoff series. Nice, <laughs> nice, uh, nice. Another son was born in the summer, and another son was born during the All-Star break, so... It nice. worked out okay. So your wife had well, it's really your wife's credit. She she had it all worked out. She, usually the women always have the answers. They're always figuring everything out to the T. Well, you know, John Stockton gave a speech when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and he said the key for me with all the road games, and I think he had I think he had six children. He said knowing that every time I walked out that front door to go to the airport, I didn't have to worry about the kids in the house because my wife took care of it, and that's the way I felt. I mean, she's the She's the all-star. She's I, I hit the lottery when uh, when I got that one. And well, good it, for you. It's been that way all throughout my whole married life. Uh, how, what's the respect factor with you and the players? Uh, are they are they, they, they kind of knowing you got such a voice on their games? Are they they try to create a relationship with you? Uh, are they they kind of want to get the story in with you so you'll say certain things, or is it do you keep your distance? No, every player is different, and <clears throat> you can't keep your distance. You have to have a relationship. You can't get overly friendly because the human nature, you have to try and remain objective. Uh, but I've always gone by, um, I will never say anything about a player on the air that I wouldn't say to his face. So you have to be critical, but if you're critical in a fair and respectful way, they'll respect you for it. Anybody that give you a little, give you a hard time about when you've been critical? Oh. I don't remember you being that critical. No, but. because I, I've been fortunate that way again. Because I've always my criticism has been, um, I, I felt respectful. You know, every once in a while, it's hard sometimes. Um, I remember one time I was really critical on J.R. Smith when he was with the Knicks. Can't imagine why you, <laughs> that would happen. And, but uh, J.R. totally misunderstood Cat because when you're with him, he's such a nice guy, right. great guy. And I right? remember, uh, wonderful guy. And in fact, I talked to him about it after because you remember Snapper Jones? Of course. He passed away last year. Um, he was such a wonderful partner and mentor. And he called me up after a game and he said, uh, he goes, I listened to you last night. He said, don't make it personal. He goes, JR played a bad game and he did some really ridiculous things. He says, but it sounded personal. And it was a great lesson. And I wound up talking to JR about it and say, hey, listen, I may have gotten a little personal over the line. I want you to know it. That's not the way I am. And he respected that. And we've, we've had a great relationship ever since. That's cool. Um, what's it like working with Mark Jackson, Van Gundy? I mean, the best. Um, I've known them both. When I first started, Jeff was an assistant coach in Mark. Straight shooter. Right. So, you know, we, we've, we've pretty much grown up in the NBA together in all different roles. And the thing I, I always say is every game I work with them, and I mean every game, I laugh and I learn because they're not afraid to stay how they really feel. There's no filter. Um, and they just have great senses of humor. And I think the audience likes the fact that we make fun of each other. If I say something that they think is ridiculous, they're all over me, and vice versa. And I think that's what makes it so much fun that we, we have such a comfort level that we're not afraid to, to tell each other how we really feel about everything. I mean, Jeff Van Gundy proves that anybody really, would, if they put some hard work into it, could be a broadcaster. Because if you knew Jeff, I mean, I don't think anybody was voting for him to be a, 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 not only a broadcaster, but an all-star broadcaster with his look, with his sense of humor, with his attitude. It was very dry, pretty straightforward, from my view. If yeah. you knew him personally, you knew he not only was super bright, but you knew that uh, he had this unbelievable sense of humor. So people, when he first started broadcasting, would say to me, did you know he was this funny? I was like, yeah, because off away from the cameras, he was good. But when he was the Nick coach, and they'd ha it was must-see TV watching his post-game press conference because he looked so miserable. It was like he was making a hostage tape. And um, he just, that wasn't his personality at the time. But once he got away from, when he gets away from coaching, he's just, he's funny, he's smart. And, and Mark has always been one of the, the smartest, savviest people I've ever met in the business. Entertainer. Yes, entertainer. Um, it's just, for me, it's, a, it's uh, I, I'm in the ultimate dream job. Brandon, I've been blessed more than I deserve. And part of that is being able to work with those two. No question, and and what an unbelievable situation. I mean, first class, top shelf. Uh, other other broadcasters you like working with, or other characters that have affected you. Who are some of the people that have kind of mentored you and taught you? Uh, besides Snapper, you know things, right. people like that. Um, UB Brown and Doug Collins. Um, 
the amount of basketball I've learned from the two of them. And again, you know, here are these, these two brilliant basketball minds, and, and they embrace you, and they welcome you in. I mean, the, the confidence that gives you, let alone all the different basketball nuances that they teach you. You be, he was unbelievable. He's, you know, he's become like a father to me. Um, he's 85, and he's still doing national games, sometimes two or three a week. Uh, he's, he's a freak of nature, and um, he's so appreciative of what the game has given him. You know, I mean, I know it's cliche, but I learn as much about life from them, from them as I do about basketball. Tell me your most outrageous game you've broadcasted and why. Outrageous. Well, it has to be the uh, the malice at the palace, the brawl between the Pistons and the and the Pacers. You um, did that game. I did that game. Whoa! And it was it was a little frightening from the standpoint of as as the you know any basketball game fight breaks out, all right, it's over quickly. But this one, one would break out, and as it was dying down, another one break out, then another one. And it didn't seem like – it just kept escalating. And the fans started coming from from the top of the first level down to the court to confront because fans were getting hit. And you just didn't know if there was enough security to stop it. And a, a, really a mob mentality took over. So – uh, it was it was a little scary. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed. They got them off the court, and that was the key to it. But that's the only time I ever felt my safe sitting at a basketball court. Um, the greatest game you've ever been to. Something unbelievable happened that you've, you've never seen before happen. It never may happen again. Um, well, that's tough. Uh, Any time a game seven of the NBA Finals, that much. Um, every possession. Every possession so important. When Cleveland came back from the 3-1 deficit and won Game 7 on the road, um, and LeBron James had that block at the end that would have sealed it for Golden State. Iguodala's clearly ahead of him. He hits that layup. Warriors win the title, and we're talking about four straight titles. Instead, he does this incredible chase-down block and saves the game for them, and they win. One of the great plays of all time. Of all time. And I love it because it's a defensive play. We all get caught up in in the three-pointers and the dunks. And they're all great and fun and exciting, but to have a defensive play determine uh, and change, you know, the history of a franchise, the history of a city, uh, that that one is right up there. Jordan, LeBron, I will not ever, never compare players from different eras. But if LeBron you had to take James, one, which one would you take first? You're a hooper. We've played some hoops yeah, no, together. No. Um, one game, I have to win one game. I think I'd take Jordan. Wow. I think if I have one game, I'm taking Magic, and I'm, I'm bypassing the two of them. Because <laughs> you get the coach, and the guy who can play five positions. Doesn't wait a minute. Have a, wait a minute. You're taking a guy who passes for a guy who used to like to shoot so much? I'm taking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm bringing my shooting back. Uh, I've been shooting a lot better lately, thank God. I, I want to go to my grave one day going, I should have shot a little more. Right. So, and that why I never got the ball much, so I'm making up for lost time. Was there anything better than that 14th Street game? I mean, think about the characters in that game, from Vesey, uh, Peter, um, you know, page six. Right. Richard Emery, Richard Johnson. The Rock. Uh, Jackie Ryan, when I Jackie mean, Ryan used to come down. I, I mean, that guy was shooting from half court. Right. Uh, I would give up a layup to pass to him at half court, which was a better shot. It was, it so, was so much fun. Oh just my guys God. that love to play. There's, there's still nothing, all my life, you know, I've tried different <clears throat> various sorts of exercises. There is nothing better than a full court run. There's nothing, nothing better. I still run, still get the game in my house. You're welcome to come and play. It's a little bit of an older game. We we get a good run in. I, I my I'm afraid of my knees now. I still like to run. I'm okay running straight. Yeah. When yeah. I got to start cutting and stuff, that's when I run. You got to prepare for it. Yeah. It's 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 some work to keep playing. I yeah. I still love the game enough for I want to play till I can't play. Oh, I know. It's remember, so remember great. The, um, there was an older gentleman in that game, and I can't remember his name. He worked for HBO. He was an executive at HBO. He was he was close to 80, and he was still doing that run. We play with a 75-year-old. Yeah. I, and and I, I, sometimes I'm guarding. I'm like, I cannot believe this guy is 75. Right. Those are my heroes. I mean, that's, you know, you got to give him credit. Right. Uh, and you got to, you know, you got to prepare for your – you can't just hope that you're going to play that long. You got to prepare for it. You right. got to eat right, and you got to, you know, stay slim and all that. Um, you like the condition the NBA game is in now, uh, and what changes would you make? The thing I love the most right now is that most of the star players – both veterans and the new players coming in, they more they care more about winning. 
you know, for a long time, young players defined their games by <coughs> how many points they scored. The young players today are defining their games by how many games they win, how many championships they compete for, and I love that. I, I think there's an unselfishness to the star element in the NBA right now, so I love that. Um, the three-pointer is exciting and fun, and you're never out of it, but I hope it doesn't continue because there's nothing better than post-play. There's nothing better than backdoor. There's it's kind of lost, though, a little yes. bit. Yeah, right? Now, it's still there a little bit, uh, and it does go in cycles, um, but that's a part of the game that I hope uh, we get back a little bit more because there are a lot of guys shooting threes now that, that should not be shooting threes. Uh, but like that's everybody. The way the game is. <laughs> yeah, that's the way the game is. That's so. the way the game is. Um, the power, you know, the power teams. Is it good, bad? I mean, probably good for your broadcast, but – there's too many have-nots. I mean, I look at the Knicks, and I get caught up in the Knicks, but I tell people, I'm like, at least Dolan has tried. He's brought in the best players he could afford, coaches, GMs, but there's probably 20 other teams in worse shape than the Knicks. Yeah, it's. Um, I do think it's, it's good to have the Goliath because people either root yeah, for this yeah. Goliath or they root against. So from a rating standpoint, for our business, it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, and quite frankly... You know, the other teams, you got to figure it out. You, you want to stop this? Well, make the right draft choices. Sign the right players. Um, do the player development the way it's supposed to be done. You've got to figure it out. It, it, can be, it can be frustrating for the fan, and nobody's more frustrated right now than Nick fans, and they're so hungry. Um, but you've got you to build the right way. There are no quick fixes, and you've got to build a franchise like San Antonio has always done. Uh, but even with San Antonio, one of the key reasons, if not the key reason why they had so much success, they drafted the perfect guy who for the next 20 years was there. So you've got to pick the right players. There's no question. I think the G League also is a big answer. I, I was talking to Adam Silver a couple months ago, and I was like, don't let those guys go to Europe. You need to develop. This college game and NBA game a little different. Develop more players, and you'll find some diamonds out of those. I think there's too small a sampling of players that stay. I think the players for not a lot of money and less money would stay here. And you got to believe that we're letting 10, 15 good players go to Europe. And out of those 10, 15, maybe there's two or three stars maybe in there every now and then. It's, it's changed. Um, I think last year, and I might be wrong yep. on exactly, I think it was 54% of NBA players on NBA rosters last year had G League experience. That's an incredible number when you think about it. And I, I'd say, what's, what's up? What's up the ante on the G League? Well, they, they did bit. raise the prices yeah. uh, or the salaries, yep. and and the franchise probably, fees, and they'll probably <laughs> right, <laughs> and they'll probably do it again because yeah. they need to do that. And it, it's a it's been a great minor league. I'm uh, a season ticket holder. I love, I'm up here all the time. Oh, it's first it's, row. I love it. I'm plus I love it for getting the coaches huddle. I, oh, easy yeah. to keep tabs yeah. on your guys, so it's it's been a great thing. Is there one thing with the way the league is set up now? I, I love they finally fixed the timeout scenario because that was just oh my god it was terrible but the replay would you change anything there or is there any rules you would change would you I always feel like could you maybe cut down one foul so maybe now five fouls so maybe guys foul less and that would kind of make the game but so foul intensive it seems like every time down it's a foul right and maybe if the guys only have five fouls to give they'd be a little more nervous like in college about fouling so quick the only thing is if, if you start cutting back now you're taking a chance of your star players not playing there are some people who think there should be no disqualification there just should be a penalty like once you get to your sixth foul there's an extra free throw because you don't want your star players sitting on the bench when people are playing money to see them um i agree with you 100 percent. they made the changes in the timeouts at the end of the game i think they can go even a little farther than that because the end of the games that's when it should be back and forth so thrilling instead of timeouts and replays and the replay part Although it's here to stay, I think we've gone too far, uh, and we've got to figure. And I don't know the answer, um, but you've got to cut back on the amount of replays because it does slow the game down, uh, especially at the end of games when it's so exciting. You look yeah, at uh, look at an NHL so hard. playoff game, hockey. Back last two minutes, you, you're on the edge of your seat. You can't move. There's and no if bathroom an NBA break. NBA game is going back and forth without time. You're on the. There's nothing more exciting than a great NBA game at the finish. But it can be so frustrating when there's all those stoppages. There's no question. Your favorite coaches? Yeah, you hear everything. You're right there, and you've heard some funny lines. 
Who's your favorite coaches and a couple of your favorite lines you've heard over the years? Well, I, I, the typical people that you know everybody says are, it's all true. Love Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, Doc Rivers. Um, a guy who doesn't get, I think, the um, attention, proper recognition and attention, who is not only a good coach, but as good a guy as there is in the game and funny as Scott Brooks. Uh, Why so? Uh, was it, he's just, he has a, he sees the big picture. Nobody wants to, to, to step on your throat and beat you more than Scott Brooks, as competitive as I can see. But he, he understands how uh, wonderful his life is because of this game. And he also understands there are bigger things than the game. So as much as when that game's going on, uh, he's just wants to just destroy you. When it's over, he's got a great ability to step back and see the big picture. Any good one-liners? Your favorite one-liner you've heard? Favorite one-liner. Yeah, you know, from a coach yelling out to a player or a ref. Oh. The ref, the ref abuse has got to be an all-time high. But if you're not sitting real close, you miss all that. Um, well, it's not an NBA. My always, my favorite line was Jim Valvano. When he would say, um, uh, let's see how the, how, the, how the proper way to put it, he said, um, "Can I?" Uh, and I'm not now. I'm, I'm on the spot. And I can't remember it. But he had a he had a he was one of those guys that had a way to. to just like I love Quinn Snyder. Like when I was at Duke camp, Quinn would be, you know we'd get into an argument about one of the calls, and he'd say, "Brandon, I'll tell the ref when he's screwing up. I'll tell the ref he just blew that call just now. <laughs> don't, you don't tell him." Now, I'll tell him. I'll tell the ref that he owes me a call. Quite frankly, though, <laughs> and stuff like that is great because it's humorous. Uh, I think one of the things that have to change is they need to stop, uh, put a stop to all the complaining. Yeah. There's way too much complaining going on, players and coaches, <clears throat> and they've got to just treat each other a little bit. It's an emotional game, but you can be emotional and respectful at the same time. Now, we know the spreads. You, know, you see, you know, teams up twenty points, and there's like, you know, several hundred people watching the game, like we're just starting. You for the gambling, against the gambling. Do you see some 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 potential problems in this gambling? Should the league be nervous? I think you have to be really careful. It can open up a Pandora's box, because there are so many people. You know, you can't question anybody's integrity, but it's very easy uh, to compromise that sometimes if you're in some kind of financial difficulty and there there you know different people in the organization who know about what's going on with with players and injuries and who's playing and who's going on and and i just think you have to oh be boy. Really careful There's i think a lot it, of possibilities. It, especially you know some of the characters you wish were a higher quality character or got you know assistant coaches or people that aren't making a lot of money that could be in a jam you could get yourself in the middle of some things that maybe you're hoping isn't going to happen right. to, to ruin the authentication of the game. Right. By the way, I just remember the Valvano thing. Oh, okay. He went to an official and he says, can you tee me up for something I'm thinking? <laughs> and the official says, nope. He goes, well, I think you bleep and bleep. <laughs> 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 that's that's my favorite line to a reference. I love that. I love that. That's funny. That's funny. So you're having fun. You're still having fun. With, you're still having fun. It's a lot of games, a lot of, lot, of, lot of movement, a lot of travel. Still having fun? Brandon, I... Uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the business. Uh, again, I'm blessed more than I deserve. To, to be able to call these games of a sport that I've loved since I was a little boy uh, is beyond my wildest. What a dream. run. What a run, Breen. I mean, it's amazing. And you know what I love about you is that, you know, sometimes you, you have a hard time finding people that are happy for your success. Everyone's happy for your success. You never meet someone that's not happy for you because I think you're one of the more well-liked, considering you, you could be in some controversy every now and then, people just love you. Well, you're obviously not talking to enough people. I'm definitely talking to enough people. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing you know, how, how people feel about you, which is a, uh, your consistency no, over time. Just, uh, I've, again, I just, um, it's, sometimes it's hard to believe. I'm, I'm absolutely living the dream. Absolutely. I agree with you. It's fun. I'm a hoop junkie, so I, I probably watch more of you than I probably should be. But I'm like, man, I can't believe you were just in one city yesterday. So I, I kind of stopped for a minute and go, man, that's got to be tough. Yeah, the only th that's you know, again, the travel is. The West Coast, then you're over here, you're there. I'm like, that guy hasn't been home in a week. And I like I, driving by airports during the summer and <laughs> having to go into the to the departure lane. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your time. Appreciate the work you do with uh, Beck. How great is Beck, huh? The oh. camp, kids. Giving back. He Love is, it. He's made, he, Bruce Beck is a New York treasure. He really is. He has had the enthusiasm and the spirit and the way he treats people 
his entire career. And, you know, you talk about thrilled for people's success. The guy is I agree. He's had a career that's wonderful. What amazes me, and, I, and you, know, you know it's true, is when I'm with a player and something comes up, we need to go to the media on it. And I can't believe how many times a Jeter or a Marion would say, well, call Bruce back then. Well, let's give him that. Right. I mean, there's a lot of choices, and his name always comes up. Right. And that's the true sign. Yeah. He's earned that credibility.